Okay, good afternoon and welcome to today's erosion and sediment control workshop, which is being hosted by Kawartha Conservation in partnership with the City of Kawartha Lakes and the Sustainable Technologies Evaluation Program, also known as STEP. My name is Sarah Finnamore and I will be assisting with today's course on behalf of STEP. Today's course will be instructed by Lisa Rocha from the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, and she is a long-standing project manager with STEP. Before we get started, I would just like to mention that while audio is available, we ask that you uh, wait for your questions um, at the end and either put them in the chat or raise your hand. I will either read out your question or call on you to turn on your mic. Please note that today's session is being recorded and I will now pass it over to Lisa. Thanks, Sarah. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I'm Lisa Rocha. I'm a project manager with the Sustainable Technologies Evaluation Program at the TRCA. Um, it's a little background about me and my journey into the world of erosion and sediment control. Um, I've been with the TRCA for about 20 years now, and my work has been focused on stormwater and erosion and sediment control research and guideline development. Uh, I've worked on, on, I would say, several field evaluations that have been focused on sediment control pond evaluations and monitoring. Uh, we've also done some evaluations of erosion and sediment control practices in general, like not necessarily ponds, and um, polymer technology for erosion and sediment control applications and pond cleanouts as well. And um, that those, I think, have really helped shape my understanding of this kind of topic and the very significant challenges of environmental protection during construction projects. I've also developed um, a few guidelines related to erosion and sediment control over the years. Uh, most recently, I led the development of the updated erosion and sediment control guide for urban construction that we released in 2019. Um, so today, Corth Conservation, reached, uh, they reached out to me a while back and um, to organize this workshop. So I'm really grateful that they did that and I have a chance to do this today. Um, and they really want to, they did this because they really want to raise the bar on erosion and sediment control in the region and definitely feel that education and training is an important part of that. So hence um, this session and the one that we have next week. Uh, so during the workshop um, and in the second one coming next week, I'll be focusing on the latest guidance on erosion and sediment control best practices. And we're going to draw largely from information in the 2019 guide and also curriculum from other step courses um, that we've offered on erosion and sediment control over the years. So I'm going to start off uh, for those who are not familiar, just talking a little bit about the Sustainable Technologies Evaluation Program. Uh, so it is a conservation authority led collaborative for right now. We have three members. So the current partners are Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, where I work. Uh, and Credit Valley Conservation and Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority, and we work together. Um, the main goal is to support broader implementation of sustainable technologies and practices, specifically in a Canadian context, um, considering the Canadian um, weather patterns and conditions that we have in legislative context as well. Um, and our goals really are to carry out research. Um, a lot of times that could be desktop research or monitoring based studies. Um, and evaluate clean water technologies to determine um, uh, whether they're effective and if there's any sort of specific um, strengths and weaknesses to those strategies and how they should be applied. Once we, um, when we look at new technologies um, that are effective um, and there's like not a lot of uptake, we look at strategies that can overcome implementation barriers. Sometimes we're looking at like, well, this should be something that's incentivized because it works so well, but it's expensive or um, there's legislative barriers um, to something that's really effective and they don't need to be in place. So some legislation or regulations or language might have to change. Sometimes people just need more support and understanding how to implement new stuff that comes into place a lot with low impact development, which is still new in a lot of jurisdictions. Uh, so we look at how do you overcome barriers to adoption? So that would be like providing more guidance and decision support tools. So that's how um, the second, the, that third uh, objective there is we develop tools, um, could be like calculators, um, modeling tools, um, anything that helps people feel more confident in designing uh, certain best practices. Also, um, we develop guidelines. 
and policies that support broader uptake of the technologies that are effective. And then lastly, we do things like this, which is engage in education, advocacy, and knowledge transfer, mostly training. Um, we do workshops. Um, and yeah, that's kind of like how we take uh, the approach to the program is those different facets of the program and, and with the overarching goal, as I said, to just support broader implementation and more uptake of technologies that really work and will result in more sustainable water management. So as far as the workshop outline for today, um, I hopefully have you for about just under an hour and a half now. Um, and I want to leave some time for questions. So we're going to cover these topics. This is more of the uh, intro 101 um, workshop. Um, so we're going to talk about a lot of fundamental things, but I think it's um, a good coverage because we also are going to talk about very specifically about erosion controls like each best management practice and each sediment control practice. Um, not comprehensive necessarily, but a lot of the main ones that um, are known and are covered in the erosion sediment control guide will be covered today. So that's a little taste of what we're going to talk about. Um, I'll be stopping for questions probably once in the middle and then at the end, of course, so I can take a little breather and also give everybody a chance to, to ask questions while their um, questions are fresh in their mind. So, uh, so I, I brought this up um, in the beginning when we first talked about um, kind of what this course is based on, but uh, new-ish, <laughs> it feels like uh, new to me because the whole pandemic is like a blur and you know our lives changed, of course, but right before the pandemic was when I was wrapping up uh, this erosion sediment control guide, so in 2019, and um, it was a uh, significant update to the 2006 Greater Golden Horseshoe Conservation Authorities Guide that a lot of people were really familiar with also. Um, so some of the, I want to just talk about highlights and things that are significantly different from what the old guide had, so I definitely encourage you to check these out in the guide itself, but um, one thing we wanted to include is a qualitative erosion risk assessment methodology. So we um, put in something that wouldn't be like a lot of calculations in math, like the what you would see in something like the revised universal soil loss equation or Russell um, that uh, we heard feedback sometimes is a lot of calculations and a lot of effort for not necessarily uh, a huge payoff on the ground and implementation, like it's not going to vastly change how effective your um, erosion and sediment control plan would be. But having some just basic qualitative um, considerations that you look at, um, we'll talk a little bit about what those are, but that will affect your erosion potential on your site. If you look at that, look at different locations of your site, consider erosion potential while you're doing your ESC plan, that's what the focus uh, in the guide on that chapter is, just um, having a little bit more thoughtful consideration of erosion uh, potential throughout your site, um, rather than just looking at soil type, a little bit more involved consideration than that. So we'll talk about, we'll touch on what that looks like in the guide. We tried to clarify the ESC approvals process. Um, some flow charts, we included like checklists that you could use in plan review. So if you're doing your submission and you want to make sure you understand everything that we would like to see, you would just go line by line um, and just you can actually say yes, included, no, not included and why. And the reviewer would have this like as almost like a, a cover and would see that like, OK, they've included all the things we look for in a submission and they've uh, in their ESC plan. That, that is to say, too. Um, we updated all the best management practices. Um, we included any new best management practices that have been emerged as effective or come onto the market since 2006. And also we eliminated any reference to proprietary names. So you used to see a lot of um, names that are were specific to certain brands. And we've moved away from all that and just made all the names generic. So hydro seeding, um, there's different types of seeding that have name brands um, we don't call it that like um, seeding with like soil is now called just like pneumatic seeding or blown um, so different names um, we've been using uh, we updated the guidance on in water isolation best management practices and we included um, 
something called a specified flood risk calculation for sizing isolation barriers. Uh, so that was something that hadn't been there before, but we thought would be very helpful in understanding, uh, helping people understand, well, how do I size a coffer dam, for example, um, when I have a certain duration of project I'm expecting, and I only want to tolerate a certain level of risk, depending on um, the level of risk you're willing to tolerate and how long you're going to be in place, which the longer the project's going to be in place, the longer, the more the chance that eventually you're going to get a really big event that could overtop. Um, so that's all the considerations that come into like that little, it's a really easy little calculation, but it kind of just helps you get an idea of like how you should be sizing things. Um, we also describe risks to low impact development features for the first time because back in 2006, low impact development wasn't like as mainstream as it is now. And so um, obviously construction really impacts low impact development features. If you're trying to install a low impact development features at the same time um, or kind of like the same time parts of your site are still under construction, this is one of the biggest reasons low impact development practices can fail, um, that they become clogged or compacted because um, they're infiltration practices at the end of the day. So they can become compacted and clogged during construction, and then they have to be rehabilitated or eventually won't work very well when you're we'll finally like have the site stabilized and you're using them. So there's some best practices just protecting those areas that you're going to designate, say for bioretention or something like that. Um, there's some best practices we've included in there. And lastly, we included... Um, guidance on how to monitor how effective your erosion and sediment control practices are, including um, like monitoring for with turbidity targets that we specify. Um, I won't get into that too much because it's pretty involved, um, but um, we've heard a lot in the past like from people in the industry, well, what what is the threshold? What are the targets that we should be looking at? And so we developed some reasonable targets for ecological protection, and they're based on both concentration of um, sediment, elevated sediment levels, and the duration of time, because that's how you would look at what the actual impacts to aquatic systems would be, not just um, a straight concentration, but also how long it's been, because a slightly elevated concentration that goes on for days and days can be just as harmful as a short burst uh, at a higher level. So, And of course, uh, where to find the guide. So sustainabletechnologies.ca slash ESC dash guide. And you can find that there. And um, yeah, any other resources associated with it would be on that site, on that page. Uh, so we're going to start off by understanding erosion and sedimentation. Um, I think it's important when you have the fundamental things down. And um, I uh, we're going to start with a little video, actually, because I think it's a nice little way of describing the key concepts. I'm going to move pretty quickly through some of these fundamental parts because then I want to have more time to spend on the best management practices. But we'll start here. Um, Sarah, please like alert me if the video sound is not working because I always cross my fingers when there's something like this. But yeah, let's watch this first. Erosion is the process of dirt particles being mobilized by wind or water. Sediment is the dirt particles in motion in wind or water. Construction site discharge is the water leaving your construction site, whether it is through pumping, surface runoff from rain or snow melt, or the construction activity itself impacting a natural water course flowing through your site. Okay, awesome. So starting off with um, erosion. Land erosion is obviously the physical removal uh, or detachment of materials by a mobile agent, so it can be most of the time we're talking about water, but also wind. Um, and there are, of course, natural, it's a natural process that happens, but is greatly exacerbated when you strip all of the vegetation from your site and you have all these bare soils. So processes like land development, construction have uh, increased erosion rates tremendously. Um, and then those particles are carried off and by stormwater and they they will not stop moving until they can settle somewhere. So the energy has to be dissipated for them to settle out and um, suspended and deposited sediment. So it's both the suspension. So as you see, the water is very cloudy there. The water um, still carries suspended sediments on that bottom picture. That can be harmful to um, aquatic ecosystems. And 
the suspensions, this not the depositing of those sediments where they ultimately end up is also um, something that can be harmful, which we'll talk about later. Sedimentation is the process by which they settle out. So they become deposited on the surface. Now, what we want on construction projects is for sedimentation to occur in best management practices, like a pond. We want things to end up in a place where we can manage sediment and remove it and clean it out and control it. Um, unintended areas like water courses, that's where it's something we want to avoid. So sedimentation that occurs in a stream, even a woodlot, any areas that are natural, someone else's private property, that's one of the biggest risks associated with construction projects and that's what we're trying to work to avoid. And so this is kind of the process, you get this lodgement, transport, and then depositing, and with sediment come other contaminant friends, uh, which is something we'll talk about. Um, so I just wanna take a little bit of time because I think understanding how erosion works is, um, is important too. Like we see it all the time. We see rills all the time. We see how erosion works on sites all the time, but just understanding like the factors that impact the different levels of erosion and how it gets severe um, is important to just distinguish. So when you're looking at splash erosion, um, that's just caused by the impact of raindrops on the surface. And of course, if you get like bigger raindrops and more intense rainfall, you're going to get a higher erosion rate when you have something like that happening. So more intense events and larger droplets. <clears throat> Once um, those are dislodged, like those particles are dislodged, um, you start to get sheet erosion um, and the dislodged particles leave as like a thin sheet or layer down like a sloped area. Obviously, water is going to flow down slope. Um, and this occurs when rain starts to fall faster than it can soak into the ground. Um, and a lot of times water will not be able to soak into the ground as well as it would have been if you're talking about a bare soil, especially a compacted soil. So it doesn't take much for water instead of deciding to infiltrate, just run off a surface. And then shallow water just begins to flow over the surface and it just continuously picks up more and more soil particles. Um, and so then what happens is you start to get real erosion and that that happens when the water starts to like concentrate in smaller like depressions and um, it erodes into form little streamlets or rills uh, on a slope face. And so they're typically described, um, we're saying rills are less than 30 centimeters deep and the distinction is basically because they can be filled in with like a pretty standard piece of construction equipment with no need to bring in any soil to fill in or move soil around to fill it in um, and just like a pretty easy fix. But when you progress to the next level and when rills, as you see down the slope, start to like kind of merge together and form like a bigger um, uh, erosive like channel, um, that's considered a gully and we, the general rule of thumb, larger than 30 centimeters deep and there's more soil displacement. So you have to sometimes bring in some um, soil just to fill in that gully and then it's more challenging to repair um, and obviously mobilizes a lot of soil into areas you probably don't want it to go. And lastly, um, when you're talking about channel, there's also channel erosion to consider and that's when the channel banks are better eroded and water flowing through a channel and, and that can happen a lot also during construction because you're just changing the hydrologic regime. So if you're removing bank vegetation sometimes or you just have higher flow rates because you've changed um, the hydrology of the area where you have a construction project happening, um, it can just cause a lot of flow in that channel and also can cause scour from the sediment loads that are being carried. And so you can see increases in channel erosion over time. And the last one we're going to talk about is wind erosion. Um, and this is funny. Yeah, this is like obviously not as something we focus on as much when we talk about erosion and sediment control. I think a lot of times we do think mostly about stormwater. Um, but wind erosion is one of the probably the largest sources of complaints, like for municipalities, because, you know, wind, um, if they feel like people that are, are neighboring construction areas feel like they're breathing in all this particulate matter. Um, and nearby and it's becoming deposited on their property all over the place. Um, so it's, you know, an air pollution concern and sediment gets everywhere. It's a common problems on construction projects, uh, a big source of complaints. And of course, it's so the sa same things that impact like um, erosion for uh, with by water. And it's just that the soil is bare 
And oftentimes it's dry, so it's a lot of the summer summer months and windy conditions that are going to cause um, this to be exacerbated. So when you look at what influences soil erosion, um, we're looking at four main categories here that everything kind of falls under, and it's climate and rainfall characteristics, the site topography, um, the erodibility of the soil itself, so it's just a characteristic of the soil that you're looking at, and ground cover, if any, that's in place. <clears throat> so I'm going to go into like each one of them just a little bit. When we're looking at soil erodibility, one of the key things is to consider your soils at the grading level and not just the topsoil and understand the erodibility class of the soils that are at the grade level. Um, when you look at um, the soil characteristics that impact particle size and soil texture, for example, um, is a big factor. So larger particle sizes like gravels are typically less susceptible to erosion and they need higher energies for particle detachment and transport. So that's why they don't move as easily. Um, and soils with a high clay content are also less susceptible to erosion because they have like a high cohesive strength so they're stuck to each other. And um, soil texture also can affect that too, the rate and volume of runoff. Another important thing is soil permeability and structure. So if they have like a high permeability, um, you're going to get less runoff and you're going to get um, more, more um, potential for infiltration, um, less risk of erosion and, and sediment transport in those situations. Um, and soil structure is really an indi indicative of the extent to which the soil particles are, are bound to one another and that affects its erosion resistance. Uh, when you're looking at organic matter, um, the soils that have like a high organic matter typically have a lower erosion susceptibility due to their moisture retention capacity. So they can keep a lot of water and they have a good soil structure on construction projects that require like extensive soil stripping. Organic content in those soils will typically be minimal. So, um, so here you can see a bit of a spectrum. This is a table you could find in the erosion sediment control guide from 2019. And you can see just a bit of a spectrum that defines like the erodibility classification of different soil types to kind of help with some decision making um, in terms of like how much you have to consider your erosion risks on your site. One of the key things, I mean, if you look here, you'll see um, one of the least erodible is clay in the least category. But importantly, um, it is um, not easy to erode clay, but once they're in suspension, they're one of the hardest types to settle out because of the size of the particles. So not all so soils erode at the same rate. So silty soils, for example, are easily erodible, while clay soils are the most difficult, but you might want to pay attention. So you might want to pay attention to areas with silty soils on your site, but it's important to know if, if even though clays are difficult to erode, they're by far the hardest type to settle out. So once they're in suspension, um, you may have a really difficult time providing enough detention time to have those particles settle out um, and may even need like some sort of assistance in flocculating that out. Um, so even areas with clay, just because there's, there are clays doesn't mean like there's not going to be like a risk there to consider. So something to think about. Um, I'm going to move on to one of the other factors we mentioned, which is ground cover. Um, so you want to obviously retain existing vegetation as much as possible, especially for areas that remain inactive. Uh, this is obviously the most significant thing you can do to maintain like the hydrologic regime and the infiltration in the area because existing vegetation is going to be superior to anything you're going to be able to establish after the fact. Um, unless it's like something you really <laughs> established like almost like as a permanent stabilization. Um, and if you do have to strip, you want to reestablish as soon as you possibly can on any bare areas. Um, and what happens when you have a vegetative cover is there's a lot of layered benefits. So there's a canopy cover that shields the ground from erosion. Um, you get less soil compaction um, because and, per, and you get more permeability. So you get more infiltration because the roots, uh, the, the roots that are established there, they improve structure, improve infiltration and increase the stability of the soil to like a large intense event. So it just provides stability, increases infiltration, shields the soil from erosive forces and overall is like the best possible erosion protection that can ever be applied. 
if you're looking at a vegetative means. Um, so this is like another similar chart with a spectrum of like efficacy of different um, covers and from the least to most um, erodible areas. So in this case, least meaning good, like it's the least susceptible to erosion. So obviously a densely vegetated area is going to be really um, not very susceptible to erosion. Uh, I think one of the interesting things to think about in this chart for me is that um, set lands get seeded and people feel like they're doing a good thing until they are established and there's significant vegetative growth. Those are not protected areas and they can be very susceptible to erosion. So even though something has been done to do um, some sort of vegetative stabilization, the establishment has to be complete before um, it can be effective. Where you see hydro seed, hydro mulch areas prior to vegetative growth are in the moderate to low category. That's because they typically also include a tacifier, which provides that protection until the seed does get established. So you'll see um, that that's just a much safer thing to like have uh, installed. Whereas if you're just doing a seed, there's no kind of tacifier, like something that makes the soil uh, kind of bind. Um, you're going to have a high erosion potential. You're going to waste the money that you spend on the seed. So that needs a blanket or something else to protect it until it's established. Uh, so also one of the most important things, topography, steeply sloping areas are highly susceptible, also long slopes, um, and they need greater consideration. So whenever you have areas like that on your site, you need to pay particular attention to those when you're doing your plan. Um, and you want to prevent erosion on the slope through a bunch of different things a multi-barrier approach, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, but um, things like stabilizing, interrupting flow, um, diverting water so that water does not flow down the slope face from the top. Water that you're conveying from the top of the slope to the bottom has a stabilized pathway. That's a slope drain, um, slope drain which we'll talk about. Um, and consider any enhanced sediment controls to protect any downslope receiving areas for sure. So. An area that you always have to pay attention to, and when you're doing your erosion risk assessment based on what's in the guideline, you would identify those steeply sloping areas and consider them differently and um, potentially focus some of your spending on best management practices in those areas the most. And then, I mean, overall, the the whole pro, um, the benefit of assessing your erosion risk really is um, you want to assess it prior to the start of construction because it's going to be the way you decide on what your ESC plan looks like. It's going to form what your ESC plan looks like. Um, so this is just a graphic of like an MTO approach where they look at different um, like polygons. That's kind of the approach we talk about. But here they're showing high risk, of course, at the water course because they they have a different methodology they used in that MTO uh, guide from a while back. But the principle is similar in that they've identified polygons and then classified their risk in each polygon. And then that's how they determine where they're going to put their best management practices, sediment controls, et cetera. Um, so as I said, the ESC guide has a qualitative erosion risk assessment methodology. Um, and what the benefit of doing something like that is it demonstrates due diligence for your site. It helps you to flag the areas that have the highest risk and identify that those areas exist early on before it's it's too late and you're just responding reactively to problems. Um, it helps with the, selecting the best BMPs and deciding where they should be placed, so where you should spend your money on erosion and sediment control. And it provides, if you give it to the regulatory agencies, more context, like, you know, back in elementary school where we always had to show our work. It's like showing your work, like, well, how did I decide where I put my BMPs and what I did? And what I chose, and this is like my thinking, this is the thinking that got me here. Um, and definitely encourages you to put like redundancies, higher, uh, more redund uh, more uh, resilient and redundancy of BMPs in areas where there's the highest risk um, or you're going to go up to a natural feature or you have a, a steeply sloping area. There's a high erosion potential in the area. That's where you want to spend most of your efforts putting your best management practices. We're going to move on to looking a little bit at, I'm sure a lot of us understand this already, but it's important to look at like exactly what, you know, layers and 
and ripple effects of the impacts are when there's like a, a sediment released to natural features in private areas. Um, so we're just going to look at a short video again and then kind of talk about some of the key impacts that we notice a lot of the times um, where there's natural areas adjacent to construction activities. We see this every day, everywhere. A piece of land with rolling hills, a creek and forest. The area has been approved for development. The equipment comes in, has to grade the land, and soil is exposed. Mother Nature is unpredictable, and you experience some windy days. The rain comes, and now you have sediment creeping into your creek. We see this every Importantly, I think in there you want to know, we, I always note Mother Nature is unpredictable. It is unpredictable. And that is why um, it's important to just have everything set up in advance, have a multi-barrier approach, assume something will fail and there's another layer of protection. That's something we're going to get into, but um, a lot of times it's the unforeseen larger events, high winds or something that ends up causing a lot of problems. Um, but um, yeah, we have to think about how to address those before and be proactive, I think. Um, so when you look at, I mean, most of the time when people think about the impact uh, of sedimentation on aquatic systems, um, that's the biggest thing I think you think about in construction projects. So what happens to fish is they experience gill clogging, less ability to site feed. They end up having uh, doing avoidance behavior and they uh, experience impaired growth then become more vulnerable to things like toxins and disease. And you're looking at fish eggs and uh, smaller organisms like benthic invertebrates, they can be um, coated and smothered by deposited sediments. Um, invertebrates will also have the less ability to filter feed, which is one of the ways they um, will feed. And also small organisms can be dislodged actually by just sediment levels that are uh, one stream is carrying a high sediment load, they can be dislodged if they're small enough. Um, then when you look at um, just the general turbidity, it will reduce the amount of sunlight that's received, which impairs the, or just reduces the ability for aquatic plants to grow. And then of course that results in a domino effect for the whole ecosystem, it's all connected. Um, and, and stream beds and spawning areas also become compromised just because of the deposited sediment or reduce the amount of oxygen they can receive and all kinds of things related to the substrate when you have a layer of thin deposited sediment on top. So a lot of ripple effects, a lot of different um, things to consider and they kind of uh, are all connected. So if one aspect of the chain is, is uh, impaired, then there's ripple effects for the other parts of that ecosystem. When you're looking at terrestrial and wetland ecosystems too, um, Sediment spills can be deposited in woodlots and damaged woodlots, wetlands, and other habitat for terrestrial species. When you have sediment that gets deposited in a woodlot, it can suppress root growth. It can damage some ground level habitats too. Um, and when you look at when it ends up in a wetland, um, it impedes the, the wetland's ability, that's natural ability to filter, and it can also smother vegetation and destroy habitat features. Uh, so less thought of maybe than um, other ecosystems, but also very harmful to these types of ecosystems. Um, when you look at water quality too, just from um, just, you know, not necessarily in connection with um, the, the uh, effects to um, aquatic organisms, um, just the fact that it impairs water quality overall. So sediment um, is t typically bound to other contaminants, specifically nutrients and heavy metals. And when high sediment levels are released in natural features, those contaminants also are elevated and tag along for the, for the ride. So it has a general impairment um, of the system when you have high sediment loads. Um, when you look at in increased nutrient levels, you can um, end up resulting in eutrophication and excess algae depleted oxygen levels. Um, also excess algae and bacteria, one of the main causes of odor and taste problems, increasing you know, the costs of drinking water treatment for a municipal uh, drinking water treatment uh, facilities and stuff. So there's a lot of um, negative effects, just not just sediment. It's not just like harmless um, soil particles that are bound, but like there's a lot of um, ripple effects too for water quality when you look at that side of things. Um, when you look at 
um, the kind of geomorphology aspect too. When you have land development, it often means more runoff and higher flows that get to the receiving systems. Um, and at any time you're looking at that, you're looking at more stream erosion and often destabilization of banks, alter channel morphology. When you're looking at sediment that's getting deposited in water bodies, you can create a sediment imbalance. There's going to be different flow patterns and conveyance capacities. And ultimately, you can have a greater flood risk um, on, um, on other uh, private properties and other areas that you didn't intend to have an impact on downstream. Um, when you look at other consequences to um, poor kind of construction site management and, and sediment releases, um, there's a lot of like kind of business and legislative side to it too to consider when you see a sediment release. Um, a lot of agencies can ultimately require you to take spend money on um, costly remediation and mitigation for the proponent to have to take on um, things for rest like money spent on restoration and stabilizing areas sometimes uh, not as often too much but charges and fines can be levied um, and of course uh, project delays which can have a significant expense sometimes more expense than any charge or fine would, would really have an impact um, sometimes the restoration include removal of suspended sediment deposits there can be stop work orders that goes back to project delays too um, and in some cases, um, having to pay to construct a new ecosystem habitat. So a lot of potential financial and uh, I would say reputational consequences um, to just having um, a negligent approach to managing sediment on your construction project if you are engaged in like overseeing a construction project. Okay, so that's all the stuff about impacts. Um, we're going to move on to kind of like the solution side of things. So we're going to talk about some fundamental principles of really good erosion sediment control and like what kind of shapes what we know to be good erosion sediment control. And then um, the specific best management practices that um, we think are the most effective and that are covered in the erosion sediment control guide. So the solution, how we mitigate impacts. Um, so we look at erosion and sediment controls, which are both structural, we mostly think about structural all the time, but also non-structural practices that prevent um, the impacts of um, erosion and sedimentation on construction sites. So non-structural, good housekeeping practices, street cleaning, um, just planning your site in such a way, stabilized uh, entrances, um, all kinds of different uh, timing, um, phasing are all non-structural practices that we don't think about as much. And in some cases, they're the most effective, like something like phasing. Um, but we often spend a lot of time thinking about the structural ones. So I'm going to talk first about erosion. So erosion control practices, they just prevent the soils from being entrained in the first place. And a lot of the times when we think about them, we think about physical barriers that are applied at the soil surface, like a vegetative practice or a blanket cover type of thing. But erosion control practices are also prevention practices. So we'll talk a bit more about that too. Um, so when you look at sediment controls, you're looking at um, removing sediment that's suspended in stormwater. So this is, uh, if already been entrained, this is already something that's the second step because you've already entrained um, the sediment and now you have to also consider okay, how to get the sediment to settle before it ends up in a feature. Um, and so you can, it's often done through gravitational settling, but some there are also filters exist. Um, but gravitational settling is most of the sediment controls we see. It's just it the sediment's going to fall out, and it's going to fall out when you dissipate that energy, and that's what all these different things are doing. Sediment control ponds, check check dams, all these things, um, those bags, everything that just makes the water like take a pause and stop and then the sediment settles out there where you've made the water stop. These are all gravitational settling controls. Well, this is um, a list of what we're gonna eventually go through in terms of the best management practices, but I wanted to specifically point out on erosion controls, um, non-structural practices in things I consider, consider more erosion prevention practices and not so much erosion control. I know it's kind of a weird distinction to make, but I consider um, it like less of a barrier and more like not even allowing 
um, a risk in the first place. So minimized or phase land clearing um, and things like that. Um, slope drains kind of like to me more prevention. Um, and then other things are more like a direct direct barrier where you know you're going to be receiving like some sort of flow on that surface and you're just getting it ready and protecting it. Whereas other things are like diverting water around things to prevent erosion. Um, so that's just a distinction I wanted to point out and give a little taste of what we're going to be looking at when we look at all the BMPs. Um, so here um, we're going to go through some of the uh, main principles. So th this entire list we're going to go through um, side by side and just kind of elaborate on what each one is. So um, these are the principles that kind of shape effective erosion and sediment control um, as, as what we've learned to date on um, through all the different studies and research we've done. So first, you want to be able to assess your erosion risk. You want to carry out an erosion risk assessment because you want to be able to identify your site, site soil types, topography, what kind of season you're going to be looking at, what kind of weather patterns you're expecting, ground cover that you're expecting to have at different times of the project. And you want to plan with that knowledge in hand because when you know better, you can do better. You want to place the best controls, layered controls, redundant controls in the highest risk areas. And that's the only way you can do that is to first understand your site. So that's why you assess erosion risk first. Um, well, these are two highlighted at the same time. That's not good. But let's ignore that. So we're just only looking at first at consent, consider erosion prevention first. Mm, these are not working. <laughs> oh, goodness. Here you go. Consider erosion prevention first. Sorry, guys, that was a bit of a glitch there. Um, you want to minimize the amount of land area that is cleared. So um, you want to avoid non-essential clearing. So all those things we talked about when we said maintaining existing vegetation, uh, not clearing if you don't need to. You want to, if you do have to clear, restabilize as soon as possible. If an area is inactive, like there's nothing planned, you want to restabilize within 30 days. I know this can be hard to achieve, but some sort of stabilization for inactive areas. Also considering phasing the development. Um, this is something that has been studied in other jurisdictions. There's been research studies about it. It's very effective. Um, from a business perspective, it tends to be hard to implement and enforce. But um, dividing your site into smaller parcels of more manageable size, where you could have a smaller parcel, complete construction, and then move on to the next area only when your site is complete and stabilized. Um, Again, from a business perspective, it can be very challenging, but this is obviously one of the most effective things you can do. Um, when we talk about something like, oh, um, again, this is not working, uh, multi-barrier approach. So what you're looking at when you're looking at a multi-barrier approach is you want to apply like the treatment train concept that applies to stormwater. Um, so you want to look at source conveyance and end of pipe controls in a series series to create a treatment train. And what that does is create a resilient system because there's redundancy, there's a backup for everything. Um, so if your first line of defense fails, there's always going to be still another control in place. And that's the whole idea of a multi-barrier approach. I think we are going to talk a little bit more about that in the future slides. Click through this faster because it's not working until. Um, so another one is slowing down and detaining runoff. So if you can slow it down, you can reduce the er erosivity of that runoff. As soon as you slow it down, um, it, it reduces its um, ability to erode. And so you want to do things like interrupt flows anytime you can, especially if you know you're going to have an area with channelized or fast flows. You want to detain runoff. You want to allow that sediment to settle out um, and potentially maybe even infiltrate or evaporate. That would be amazing, just reducing the amount of water overall. Um, that's less likely where infiltration is difficult on construction projects, but um, you just want to allow as much settling areas and opportunities as you can. Um, and of course, things like flow interrupters and conveyance channels and stormwater outlets and also along contours of slope. So anywhere where you're going to have water flowing over a surface, you want to try and slow it down so you don't create like highly erosive flows. You want to also divert any runoff around problem areas. Um, problem areas meaning areas that are not necessarily <laughs> that are going to be highly susceptible to erosion. Maybe they're unstabilized, uh, maybe it's slope. So um, you want to consider whether the ground can withstand the erosive forces that you're 
going to be directing towards it. If not, you want to use diversion measures like a slope drain. So that's like collecting all the water. Um, if there's water flowing down a slope face, you want to collect the water um, in, in a um, kind of like a channel and convey it to a slope drain. And then you want the slope drain to convey the water down the slope rather than water free flowing down a slope face, um, which is going to cause a lot of erosion and, and real erosion specifically in gullies maybe. Um, so things like interceptor swales, slope drains, they just specifically take the flow and convey it. You want to control the water. Don't let the water control you. So you want to decide this is my stable flow path and this is where I'm going to be directing my water and taking it to where it needs to go to either a best management practice where it's going to be further treated or released or whatever it's going to be. Um, but you want to be able to move water around your site in stable flow paths anywhere you have to move water. You also want to just minimize slope lengths and gradients. So for long and steep slopes um, that are like slopes more than 10% or longer than 30 meters, you want to be able to uh, kind of use stabilization. Um, you want to use a flow diversion if you can, like a slope, um, slope drain, and you want to do flow interruption along there. So you want to maybe put like um, some silt talks or something just to kind of slow flows down on that slow face and prevent, prevent the slope from eroding. Um, of course, ideally in addition to stabilization, but any any sort of thing you can do to uh, install there is better than having nothing at all. You always want to avoid having concentrated flows. So if you do have concentrated flows, you want to make sure um, that it's along a planned, stabilized path. Um, specifically things like discharges from pumps where you do have like a very high velocity concentrated flow. You always want to make sure you somehow dissipate that. You could use like a geotextile bag to kind of spread it around. Make sure the ground area that the water is being received in is hardened in some way or stabilized so that it's capable of receiving the flow without causing erosion at the pump outlet. And lastly, you always want to like look at the ESC plan as a dynamic document and evolve it as needed. Um, so it's a living document. It's not like, well, I got my approval and now I don't have to ever think about that again. Like you want to modify because the main the main objective is not just obtaining the approval. The main objective is ensuring the environment is protected from sediment releases at all times. That is the objective. And so if you have a minor change, you can just be mark marking that up and send that to the reg of, uh, regulatory agencies just for information. And, and if, obviously, if it's a very significant change, um, maybe resubmission. But uh, it's, it should be viewed as a dynamic and living document and not something that is just shelved and only addressed once and once it's stamped that it's never thought of again. Um, it should always be revisited if needed. Um, so we're going to look at another video here. And so just start that. And this one is about multi-barrier approach. Erosion controls are measures that can be put in place to stop the soil from moving in the first place. Sediment controls are measures you can use to deal with the soil that is in motion. Based on the concepts above, many people think if you only employ erosion controls on your site, then you don't have to use sediment controls. This is a general misconception and definitely not good practice, as both erosion and sediment controls should be used as a multi-barrier approach. Take, for example, football strategy. Erosion controls are only the first line of defense, so your tackle, your linebackers, and your cornerbacks. But as with most things, they are not perfect and can fail, so you have to be prepared. Sediment controls are the second line of defense, so your safety. That should be in place to catch any sediment that has made it past your erosion control measures. Used together, the multi-barrier approach will help minimize dirty runoff from leaving your site. Erosion control. Okay, so the multi-barrier approach we talked about before, it's the idea of having multiple things in place. If something fails, you just heard. So here's a little example. Um, there's a vegetated buffer that they've left. Um, there's an erosion control blanket, there's silt fence, um, and there's just multiple things in place before um, any sort of harm would any sort of sediment would reach a receiver. So um, what you want to do is apply sediment controls and erosion controls in series, and you want to create a resilient system that always has another backup in case the first one fails, which happens very often. You always can 
count on something failing, but is it going to cause a sediment release or is it just going to cause one piece to fail and I still have protection? And that's what you want to look at always. I'm going to take a small pause uh, to figure out if there are any questions. Um, so Sarah, let me know if you had any yeah. questions. Hi. We, we do have one in the chat. Okay. Uh, so when using stormwater management ponds during construction, I understand that they are a sediment control, but should they be considered a last defense and should we be trying to minimize the amount of soil entering the swim pond, for example, using silt sacks and road cleaning, particularly when the pond outlets are sensitive to features. So kind of what you were just talking about using multi-barrier yeah. approaches. Yeah. I mean, if it's sized effectively, like you definitely want to make sure. So a lot of times sediment control ponds will be put in, but they won't be stabilized um, and they won't be maintained very well. You have to consider the fact that they fill up much faster than a normal stormwater management pond. So if you aren't doing anything to mitigate the amount of um, water um, coming into that pond all at the same time and the amount of sediment coming in, um, it's going to fill up really fast and the odds are they're not going to be cleaning it out as much as they should. So it's just going to be full of sediment and not function. So the, the way the sizing criteria for sediment control ponds is it's designed specifically to, you know, provide the capacity um, for certain events. So it's sized it, as soon as you your capacity is reduced, the size it's going to be more likely that you're going to have sediment releases. And one of the biggest things that with any sort of wet pond that, um, Effect, it's if efficacy. It's not so much concentration. It's actually the big amount of water that comes in and pushes things through. So it's actually quantity more than the sediment, um, the se sediment concentration in your in influ um, influence. So if you had not a lot of in uh, influence, if not a lot of flow coming in, and it was really turbid, yes, you're going to fill up your pond pretty fast. But that's not where you see that really bad sediment release leaving the outlet it's when you have like really big events so actually this is hard to do on construction projects but more ponds more detention more areas where water can rest and maybe even stay on your site for a while and not be all coming into your pond at the same time is going to end up being way more effective in terms of reducing the total sediment leaving your outlets um, so it's more a quantity control thing that you want to try to achieve on construction projects um, then it is just like pure looking at like I took a sample and my sediment was just really uh, turbid here. Like, well, how much water was moving around? Um, one thing that's hard to do on construction projects because people don't want water sitting around. They would like to make less sediment control ponds. Many of them would like to just make one sediment control pond and that's where the ultimate pond is going to be. Um, but that's not what the guidance says. We'll go through the best management practices and what the guidance says, but um, more detention areas is always going to result in a better um less sediment leaving your site because you just want to control the quantities of water as much as you can not so much the sediment level although that's important too but quantity okay great uh if anyone else has any questions please put it in the chat or raise your hand and if not i think we can continue yeah, we'll, on we'll do more another session i just have we're going to go through all the best management practices now, and then we'll have more question period. Uh, so that'll be good. Perfect. OK, so we're going to start off with erosion control measures and another really good video um, from, um, yeah, similar people that did the other ones. But I think it's a really good um, kind of overview of erosion control. So let's look at this one. Erosion controls are your first line of defense. We brought you to an active solar power farm project site where we have many challenges with erosion control based on our topography and soil types. Experienced erosion and sediment control specialists recognize the importance of dealing with erosion risk in various ways as the first line of site protection. Every attempt should be made throughout the lifespan of a project to schedule and sequence construction activities and site development so the protection afforded by the existing vegetation can be used to advantage. In the case of this site, the trees have been cut and cleared from the area, but grubbing activities have been delayed to coincide with the first stages of earthwork. This has effectively reduced the risk of erosion over a long period of time. The strategic clearing is also very effective in dealing with linear projects like pipelines, utilities and road construction. It allows for a sequenced approach that exposes active areas of construction that are manageable and able to be stabilized very quickly after completion. 
When the vegetation is removed and the topsoil is stripped, it is still possible to maintain some vegetation that can be an effective buffer, adding to both erosion protection and improve the effectiveness of sediment controls. This simple consideration, well demonstrated here, can drastically improve compliance with discharge requirements and overall project success. If erosion protection is thought of throughout a project, various techniques and erosion control products can be used to stabilize and protect completed areas, which can drastically reduce the strain on sediment controls and minimize overall risk. Some examples include rolled erosion control products that can be applied to flat areas, slopes, and ditch lines, such as the coir matting that you see here, turf mats and traditional sod, as well as revegetation through seeding, plantings, and the application of mulches here and behind me. In recent years, there's also been a growing interest in the application of polymers and other binding agents to assist in erosion protection. During active construction of the areas of the project for which erosion control is not feasible, consideration now needs to be made to manage the water that will be flowing to those areas. What we mean is that you need to control your water, not have your water control you. This can be accomplished in a number of ways. The implementation of slope drains, which pipe water down a slope and provide complete control over where the water will go. The installation of berms to keep water from entering active areas and direct it to desired locations. And the construction of diversion channels to effectively control water in order to keep it away from active construction. Since we know that the velocity of water in concentrated runoff flows also increases erosion, it is important that any constructed diversion channels and slope drains or berms be stabilized and direct water to stabilized areas that can accept those flows. While every project and every site is unique, the risks associated with soil erosion are present in every case. It has been demonstrated time and time again that if erosion protection measures are effectively implemented, it greatly decreases strain on sediment controls and the risk of sediment movement from a site. Great. Okay, so going into some of the erosion control best practices here. Um, so they are the most important line of defense in any erosion sediment control plan because they prevent and minimize erosion from occurring in the first place. And it's always going to be more cost effective to prevent or minimize it than it is to treat it once it's in suspension because that is challenging and more costly. Um, so one of some of the the key things we're going to go through, we're going to go e through each one. So minimize your phase land clearing, interceptor swales, slope drains, surface roughening, mulching, seeding. A lot of things are kind of, those things are put usually best in conjunction with one another. But we'll talk about that. Uh, rolled erosion control products and chemical stabilization, also poly it's kind of polymers really is what we're talking about there. Um, and tachyfiers. Um, so first talking about minimized or phase land clearing. Um, in this case, so minimizing clearing means identifying areas where you can preserve vegetation throughout the project, whereas phasing clearing is only that a portion of the site is stripped and developed at a time, with the next phase only initiated once the earlier phase is complete and stabilized. So they're two different things. I think they're sometimes used interchangeably, but minimizing clearing, leave vegetation, phasing is to do with like planning the different phases of development. Um, so you want to reduce erosion by retaining vegetation and restabilizing really quickly. And this also just promotes more manageable sites. Some of the opportunities where um, you can uh, do this is really um, parcels designated for later development, any vegetative buffer like you saw in the video at site perimeter and any areas that are going to be not constructed at all for a long time. There's no need to strip them. Um, so another important um, kind of, I, I consider this erosion prevention is interceptor swales. You see this a lot on construction projects. It's just the execution of them that often falls short of really having a big impact and being really effective. So they're obviously supposed to intercept and collect runoff, convey it through a flow path that is intended and stabilized instead of allowing water to go every which way and also keeps water away from active construction areas, which is a desirable in terms of the business of construction. Um, so it reduces erosion by just putting it in a defined, ideally stabilized flow path. So one of the things you'll see often is non-stabilized flow paths, which is just susceptible to erosion and not really allowing you to, it's just entraining more sediment along the way. Um, you wanna optimize it by stabilizing it for sure and check dams because that's how you're gonna actually cause if you are bringing sediment laden water into this cutoff swale, you want to allow opportunity for settling before you get to ideally, hopefully, a, a larger best management practice like a pond at the end. 
but like if you can be removing sediment along the way by having check dams and interrupting that flow, that's what you want to be doing. Um, so you want to prior priority areas where they should be installed for sure when you want to put in an interceptor swell is along the top of an unstabilized or long or steep slope and then maybe use a slope drain. So you want to interrupt the flow there and then convey it down the slope if that's where it's going um, uh, through like a slope drain along the perimeter of the site, along the toe of slopes, uh, adjacent to val valley and stream corridors and any river flows are being diverted around a newly like seeded or planted area because you want to give that area time to get established so you're not wasting all the money you spent on seeding and also just contributing of course to erosion which is the whole point of stabilizing in the first place to mitigate erosion um, here's an example of a good versus a bad interceptor swale um, as you see on the right um, there is no stabilization whatsoever um, and there's a lot of things that they've done wrong here um, and you can see that it's just as susceptible to erosion, the shape of them. There's no geotextile underneath, um, but we will go through a good example of what it looks like to have uh, proper check dams. Um, as you can see, it's not even really holding back water, um, but whereas in the left side, you can see it is holding water back. Um, it is um, stabilized completely and it is allowing water to be detained and settle out um, upslope of it and then trickle slowly through um, and it's, having a desired effect and desired purpose really um so here we're going into slope chains which we've mentioned several times we talked about like erosion prevention and in the video he talked about it too but what you're doing is using a pipe to convey that flows down the slope and you want to prevent erosion on the bare slope face so it's usually installed with some sort of water containment diversion structure uh, up top to just collect and convey it to the slope drain and on long slopes, you could also use terraces to intercept sheep flows on the slope face because um, you're dealing with water that came from at the top of the slope and then you're dealing with any water that's incident on the slope face, which can also cause erosion. So you want to deal with the slope drain, but you also want to deal with um, a stabilized or like flow interrupted or terraced um, face of the slope. So you can also intercept the sheep flows that can cause erosion on the slope. Um, you always want to make sure it's secured to the ground and like this perfect example, apply some sort of energy dissipation at the outlet. So here they've got like some stone. Um, and so you want to just make sure that the surface is prepared for that concentrated flow and um, you're not going to cause any erosion problem there. So that's a, a good little example of a slope drain. Um, that's more on the erosion prevention side. And some of these practices we're going to get into now are um, a lot of related to seeding and things that could be done in conjunction with seeding and like preparation of ground surfaces and things like that. So a surface roughening is something that's always been talked about, but really you're just creating grooves and depressions. They do slow down runoff if done properly. As you can see, they're perpendicular to the flow path. You don't want to create <laughs> actual more channels and rills. So if you're not doing it properly, you're actually creating rills, whereas you, you're going up the slope. Uh, with some machine like this, like a dimpling machine um, would be creating like kind of grooves that would uh, kind of roughen the surface and slow water down. But it really is a bit limited in effectiveness. So for sandy or rocky soils, as you can see, you wouldn't be able to shape the soil that way. And also it's just infinitely better when used as like almost like a preparation for seeding or in conjunction with something else like um, seeding and mulching um, to like increase that potential of that surface to like not to decrease the erosion potential of that surface really. Um, so then you look, we're looking at something like mulching. And so this is something used a lot on construction projects, but you're just putting in organic material. So like straw compost wood shaving on a soil surface. Um, and it's really good if you use it with surface roughening and seeding, um, but it helps just to help the soil retain moisture, regulates temperature, and keeps the soil healthier. Um, if you're using with seed, it makes keeps the seeds insulated and keeps them in place. Um, and it also reduces runoff velocity. So there's a lot of benefits to a mulching. Um, and it's, it's an effect you can use like vegetative clearing waste from your actual site and use it for the mulch. But um, there's all kinds of different mulching options now. Um, so some of the materials that are used are like straw or hay, uh, which can be used 
in conjunction with the tachyphyre or can be crimped in. So the picture on the far uh, left is just a crimp. It was a uh, straw that was crimped in uh, with the machine. Um, you can use shredded wood, bark chips, paper fiber, compost. Um, there's an example in the middle of just a hydraulic um, spray of hydro mulch. So it's like water. There's usually a, almost always, I mean, there's a tachyphyre in there for sure. And there's a dry mulch. So that's why it just sprays on like, looks like hydro seeding, but doesn't have any seed in it. So, um, and then you can also blow on mulch uh, with blower trucks. And that's something uh, we'll talk about too with seeding, because you can also blow on um, seed with soil, with growing media and everything. Uh, but sometimes it's just mulch and tachyphyre. Uh, when you're looking at seeding, um, you can be using seeding for temporary or permanent erosion control broadcasts. So just for small areas or even with machinery for larger areas, but it's just like throwing seed on the site, um, broadcasting seed. Hydro seeding is like where that truck on the top you see um, just spraying that on just like the hydro mulch machine. Uh, it's a mixture um, of like emulsifier, um, the water, the seed and all the different things, uh, not soil though. Hydro seeding would not include the growing media. And then the last one, it's pneumatic seeding with growing media. I think, I mean, a lot of the times people for a while, the only company is Terra seeding. So they would call it Terra seeding, but that's a brand name. Um, so it's just the concept of blowing it on. And that's the bottom picture there on the right. That's what they're doing there. Um, so it's just everything in one shot. Um, you wanna use annual species as a cover crop alone or as part of a permanent seeding mix just to get that fast stabilization just to reduce uh, the risk of erosion when you're getting established. You can use uh, species like winter wheat, buckwheat, oat as your cover crop. Um, we have a cover crop decision guide in the ESC guide. It's from Credit Valley Conservation but it's pretty good. You may have local considerations but it's more just a decision guide. Um, I think I have it in, a, in one of the slides coming up. Uh, it's an Appendix B, but um, you want to definitely look at local guidelines and lists of accepted species when you're determining your permanent like seed mix. So you want to look to your local conservation authority. Um, if there is something, you want to make sure you're in line with what the local agencies would like you to be planting. Um, and you want to establish cover that's adequate for erosion protection. But if you want to do that, um, you, it can take one growing season or up to three years, depending on your application rate and the species. So a cover crop is really important. Um, I thought this was a useful table. This is also from the ESC guide, but if you wanna to refer to that, I don't wanna waste too much time on it here, but it kind of gives you an idea of application, like where sh should areas of a site where you could be using broadcast versus mechanical versus hydro seeding um, versus pneumatic seeding with growing media. So kind of like just a decision support table to help understand what's the most suitable depending on your whether you're looking at a in a swale or a slope pond banks etc um and this is that decision matrix for um that i was talking about uh for cover crops so uh, this is right from the esc guides you can see it there this is from credit valley conservation and kind of just helps you understand and make decisions um, based on what your seeding objectives are season how long uh, or short term things are going to be in place um, and just really a good, I thought, decision guide to include because it's just really helpful. Um, just things to consider. And of course, local considerations have to be taken into account, but it's something I think is important to look at, um, especially if maybe there isn't as much local guidance available. Uh, moving on to another really important erosion control, um, looking at what we call the category of rolled erosion control products. I think a lot of times people will just call them blankets, uh, but there's different categories in this um, and there are different categories for different strengths, really. So um, it's always a prefabricated blanket and it's a ground cover. It's usually organic and combination of organic and synthetic materials and they act as a barrier to erosive forces. forces. They also protect your seed, uh, prevent uh, erosion. Um, they moderate the soil temperature, keep everything in place while you're establishing seed. Um, they also are often used without seeding sometimes, but yeah, you can use them um, in a lot of different applications and they're highly effective when installed properly. So, and when you're looking at something like a netting, that's the first picture on the right, you're looking at a woven degradable net, like something like jute, straw, choir, um, and it's just temporary stabilization and it's best 
when you're using it over like a mulch um, to get extra stabilization layer. Um, for blankets, you're typically looking at something composed of choir straw or wood fiber woven with a photodegradable netting and it makes like a thicker blanket. It's stronger than a netting in terms of like how long it will last, but you can get short to long term. So nine to 18 months uh, is a short term and you can get one that will last one to two years actually. Um, and so it's in the middle category, uh, but they have really good ground contact. Um, so these are very popular. And the, the third level is the highest level of protection, which would be a turf reinforcement mat. This is like a hardy material. It can be like a coconut husk fiber synthetic. The one you're seeing there on the right uh, bottom of the green is synthetic. It's going to give you the highest tensile strength and the most long-term um, protection. Um, and they're usually combined with the protect. They kind of combine the protection of a blanket with the reinforcement of netting and it gives you really long, uh, like strong protection and it's good for steep slopes um, and it's more for permanent stabilization and you would use it like if you have highly erodible soil. So turf reinforcement mats are more for a permanent solution in general. Um, so places you can use it, slopes, unvegetated swales and ditches, um, pond banks, that is actually a slope there, but that's actually was uh, a sediment control pond bank um, and diversion channels. Um, so about, a lot of uses for blankets on ESC sites and other rolled erosion control products. Um, one important thing I wanted to talk about, especially I know this is, uh, I mean, we're from Toronto um, and um, even more, this is even more important, I think, uh, for the Kawartha region, but um, you want to be considerate of putting um, certain types of blankets in natural areas. So the any rolled erosion control products that have like the biodegradable or photodegradable plastic netting, um, they are really good in terms of how much erosion uh, prevention, like they have a high tensile strength, but they can also result in ensnarement of like smaller wildlife, like snakes, turtles, and frogs. Um, there's many examples of this happening in, in photos, sad photos of, of you see this happening. And so it, it is with some consideration that you should be choosing these if you're putting them in areas that are frequented by wildlife, like riparian areas, um, even stormwater pond banks. Um, you may want to opt for 100% biodegradable products that don't have any plastic netting. Uh, examples are jutes, sisal, choir, fiber, choir. Honestly, I never know how I want to say choir or choir, but I think it's choir, uh, fiber. Um, and just like ideally a loose weave design so the joints are a bit movable so they won't necessarily become trapped because it's like a movable joint that won't keep them um, there to die <laughs> essentially. So um, where you do have to use plastic netting, you want to remove that as soon as it's no longer needed, like reduce the amount of time it's in place. Um, just to not be a wildlife hazard, really, which it has demonstrated to be in some places, for sure. Um, moving on to the last category I'm going to talk about on erosion prevention today, erosion um, control, is chemical stabilization. Um, so these are substances, there are synthetic and natural ones, and what they do is just they make the soil cohesion better, like they make the soil bind its particles to one another or to a mulch. And what happens is it just keeps it all together and keeps it in place. A lot of times during seed establishment, but they, they actually work like in general, like just to keep the soil in place. Um, but as soon as they wear off, um, they, the soil will not be like providing, uh, protected anymore. So that's why a lot of times it's considered like a tide over, just like a blanket would be, where it's like, I'm protecting the soil, but I'm waiting for a seed to be established. Um, so it's often used in hydro seeding, hydro mulch mixes. Um, you can get infiltration through it, even though you think of it like, okay, it's like some sort of like synthetic thing I'm putting on top of the soil. It still allows infiltration, which is the great thing about that. It keeps everything in place. Um, so there's some plant-based solutions like uh, guar gum, psyllium, starch, longer term ones are like tree resin, pitch emulsions, um, things like synthetic petroleum derived polymers. So anionic polyacrylamide, that's that white powder in the middle there. I'm not sure what I have on the right there. It looks like an emulsion. Um, you would put like in a hydro seeding or hydro mulching machine. Um, but 
uh, and then there's cementitious binders. So there's different categories. Uh, a lot of times when you get somebody to do like a hydro seeding, you don't necessarily know what's going to be in that mix and it just comes as a package deal. Um, but sometimes also people use um, an, an polycrylamide powder on its own and just apply that to soil surfaces. And that's that powder. I've seen that done. Um, so they definitely do provide uh, pretty effective, um, but they are, there's temperature considerations for sure. It's not really very effective. I don't think as effective in cold situations. Um, so you want to use them, not use them within 30 meters of natural feature. And if you have to be a subject to like the regulatory agency approval, um, you only want to apply it on bare unseeded soil if the area will not be subject to vehicle traffic. So it's not so strong that you can just apply it on like all your tr uh, roads throughout the construction um, site and, and that it'll just hold up like it's not really necessarily going to work if you have high erosive forces and and vehicles driving down and breaking down that soil. Um, cationic polymers and chitosan are some that should be avoided um, unless there's some sort of proven but they're not really typically as frequently used for stabilization especially chitosan I, I don't use see that used as much for stabilization as for flocculation which we'll talk about later. Um, but you want to just ensure that it's safe at the intended application rate, and that's on the manufacturer to prove um, and consult local policies on the use of polymers. Consider what local agencies are comfortable with, because it may vary from area to area um, and specifically. Um, so, yeah, I just want to look into that. But we do have some guidance that we developed several years back on the use of anionic polycrylamide specifically. Um, and there is like uh, that guide that you see there on the right is available online on the Sustainable Technologies website. So there's some important guidance in there. Um, and the picture on the bottom is just an example of like completely bare soil where nothing else has been done to it. But there has been anionic polyacrylamide applied. And as you can see, like it's it's hard to tell just from looking at a picture and not touching it yourself. But he's pressing on the surface and it's just completely um, adhered to itself and stabilized, um, you know, until the next application is required. So for a period of time, it does give you that pretty significant stabilization. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to sediment control measures. And again, we have a little bit of an intro video to start off this section. The best way to look at sediment control is by project stages. Before you start construction activities, you must correctly install on-site perimeter controls. While perimeter controls do provide site delineation, more importantly, they have the last line of defense to contain and control sediment runoff from your site. There are many effective types of perimeter controls, such as silt fencing, we've upgraded to 4x4 posts here, logs, wattles, and soil berms. But the key to their effectiveness is proper installation and application. Throughout the grubbing, clearing, and soil stripping phases, you will notice that areas that are previously stable with vegetation are now exposed. While stabilization is one of the best methods to combat sediment transport, as we saw in the erosion video, this area had a vegetated buffer. It has now been removed to allow for phased pond construction. During the grading phase, drainage wells often form naturally due to the ongoing change in elevation. In conjunction with rock check dams, which we have here, drainage wells can effectively consolidate flows and transport the water to where you want to go. As you saw in the erosion video, you control the water on your site. Don't let it control you. In order to construct effective drainage wells, it is important to remember that water flows naturally downhill. Swales should be lined to reduce erosion and maintenance. As you see here, we've lined this one with rock. Once wells are constructed, a receptor is necessary to effectively treat the water. This can be a temporary sediment pond or a permanent storm pond. The intent is to let the sediment drop out and draw the water from the surface of the pond for discharge. And remember, the longer the water has the pond, the more sediment will come out of suspension, giving you a cleaner discharge. During the active construction and excavation stage, there are key things to keep in mind. If water needs to be pumped from excavations, put the pump in a filtered sump. Here, we've placed gravel underneath the suction end of the pump to create a barrier from sediment. Discharge sump water into swales, ponds, or filter bags. Never discharge over raw, disturbed soil. As you can see here, we have a filter bag discharging over wood chips to provide a barrier. Then, proceeding through the perimeter controls to the vegetated area. 
And remember, as discussed in the video, add sediment controls where erosion controls are not possible. Okay, so looking at sediment controls, what you're doing in this case is water is already uh, picked up sediment um, and erosion has already happened and you're removing suspended sediment typically through gravitational settling or filtering. Um, and so any of these practices are going to promote the settling of suspended particles, usually by reducing energy, uh, the energy that's in that water uh, in some way. Um, so we're going to look at a whole bunch of different applications, uh, BMPs here in the next few slides, and I'll go through them. Um, so one of the most popular, one of the things we see on almost every construction project uh, is sediment control fence. Um, so this is geotextile material that's supported by posts entrenched into the ground, um, and it's applied to reduce flow velocity to pond sheet flows and to promote gravitational settling. So it's not filtering the water, it's slowing it down so that the water settles out. Um, what it is typically should be used is to redirect sheet flow toward a treatment area, like a sediment control pond or trap but it is not a sediment filter. So it, any fines uh, or any particles that are larger than 50 micrometers will pass through. Um, and they are meant to be installed perpendicular to sheet flows, but not in concentrated flow paths. Like we, we do often see this as a thing, but this should be not uh, a check dam. It's not a check dam. Uh, it's not meant to be used that way. Um, and the components that are part of it are geotextile fabric and structural support fencing that sometimes you'll see like that page wire fence uh, and posts. Um, so in what applications are good along perimeter of construction site, that's where you almost always see it on sites where there's almost no other erosion and sediment controls. You'll see a perimeter sediment control fence almost every time along any upgrading side of sensitive areas. You want to put uh, sediment control fence streams and river corridors around stockpiles of excavated material. Um, there's other options you could use, but that's one option. Like you could use uh, filter socks also. Um, approximately uh, 1.5 meters away from the base of any moderate slope. Any other areas where sediment laden sheet flow requires treatment, and as long as the fencing is installed parallel to the site contours. So that's what you want to be um, getting sheet flows only. And when you're using it as a barrier to protect a natural feature, you might want to consider an enhancement. So one enhancement could be 10 by 10 uh, wooden posts um, instead of T-bars, or um, you could use double row silt fencing. Uh, sometimes you'll see double row silt fencing and there'll be straw bale uh, in between, like um, kind of like just a structural reinforcement. So um, these are all things that give you that multi-barrier redundancy approach. If you're butting up to a protected natural feature, sensitive feature that is particularly important to protect. You don't want to put like the bare minimum cell fence. Um, this is a graphic that's in the ESD guide. So we kind of recreated some really important um, design drawings that everybody references um, from. Um, I think that's LR as the one that she's been, she's been doing, Lisa Rocha. Sorry, can you mute Sarah? Um, and so this is a drawing for. For me as a... Sorry, someone's not muted. So if we could just take a chance and mute somebody. That's Sorry, I've got it. Um, so this is um, a, a good example of like just a drawing. It's very much the classic way it's always represented. Um, you want to uh, make it like in a J curve facing upslope to ensure that it doesn't um, go, water doesn't flow around the sediment and um, like around the, sorry, around the fence. Um, so that's an important feature, the J hook, uh, J curve, and um, just how it's installed and trenched in is all described in the drawing here. So this is something I, I highly encourage everyone to look at. And one thing the people that I worked with on the ESC guide really wanted to include is frozen conditions because sometimes you do have to install sill fence and the ground's already frozen and trenching is not possible. Um, and so an alternative option here would be not to trench it in, but instead to um, just use like. Um, this um, fa filter fabric and a filter sock and stake that in place um, and use that as an alternative. Um, one of the alternatives you'll often see would be like just a bit of stone there, um, but this is considered like a, a better version of that option um, to keep the, um, the geotextile um, in place and instead of having to trench it in. And, and obviously it's not necessarily 
as strong uh, of a sill fence as you would get when you're applying it in unfrozen uh, normal soil conditions. But if you have to install it, this is an alternative that you could consider that could be effective. Um, another great sediment control is filter stocks and natural fiber logs. These have become increasingly popular over the past, I would say, uh, like a couple of decades, really. They've been popular now. Uh, and they're tubular devices that interrupt flow. They slow it down. Uh, for filter stocks, you're looking at like a mesh casing that's typically filled on site with compost or like a wood chip material. Um, increasingly, they've been with, filled with wood chips more and more, and they used to be more with compost. I think it was to do with maybe the availability and price of compost. Uh, but compost, um, if it's good quality compost, does remove more contaminants than the wood chips, whereas the wood chip material um, does a very good job of still causing the, the sediment to settle out. It just doesn't have that ability to like kind of uh, adhere to and retain certain contaminants. Um, but wood chips is one of the things you'll see a lot of times filling these socks now. There's also fiber logs. Those are typically more prefabricated and composed of materials like straw, flax, coconut, or wood fibers. And those are not necessarily filled on site. Um, and you just want to pawn the flows. Um, they also do have some uh, filtration benefits if they're compost filled. So they kind of like do remove contaminants through water passing through them. Um, they can be seeded to, and there's a lot of different circumferences for different applications. Um, and definitely the ESC guide has way more guidance on this. Um, but e some of the ways you would put it is as like a flow interruption when you apply it perpendicular to sheet flows on a level and sloped areas at the base of slopes and stockpiles. When you're looking at along the site perimeter, that's another option in areas of sheet flow. Um, perpendicular to channelized flow in swale, so they can be used as check dams not like still fence, but they, they can be used in both applications as perimeter and ditch checks. Um, around storm drain inlets, as you can see there in the middle picture, when you're receiving sheet flows there, um, and around sediment bags in a dewatering treatment train type approach. So if you have a sediment bag land on a flat surface, you can put this um, around as like another barrier um, before water is uh, leaving the area. Um, and during frozen conditions, again, you can use it um, in place of sediment fence. Um, that cannot be trenched in. So that's another option completely um, instead of sediment fence. Um, then other type of check dam would be a rock check dam. So in this case, you're looking at something made of granular material. Again, there is uh, an OPSD for this that we've included um, in the ESC guide. Um, and it's applied across low flow swales and ditches to reduce flow velocities, uh, enhances sediment settling and reduces erosivity. Um, but it does have limited ponding ability and it, it doesn't necessarily allow you to settle fine. So you're going to get more of the coarse sediment settling out. Um, also in di in series and ditches with longer, steeper slopes. Um, and you definitely want to make sure the height of each subsequent downstream dam is determined by the ground elevation of the previous dam. So there's like a rule of thumb there for how you space them. That's really important. Also defined in the ESC guide. Never want to use these in water courses. That's very important to remember. Something that doesn't get as much like attention, I think, is storm drain inlet protection. A lot of times you'll just see like a sad little piece of filter fabric. Um, I think I want to point out here, there's just a lot of options on the market these days um, to protect the drains. Um, this, a lot of people feel like it's not so important because it's going to sediment control pond. It is still important. You don't want to just allow sediment to free flow into your sediment control pond. Um, and a lot of these construction projects linger and linger and linger um, and the roads are in place and you'll see like just very terrible controls in the uh, in, inlets. So I think some of these other solutions can be really effective and something I would definitely encourage people to start to consider more. Um, but you can have a geotextile filter uh, in a bag or sack configuration that hangs below the grate. You can do a sediment retention barrier around the outside. Um, you can do a filter that's placed over the inlet. That's like this choir thing here, um, perforated riser pipes, but um, you don't want to impede drainage. You want to maintain these maintenance and like inspection is one of the key things when it comes to these types of things because they can get clogged um, and they can rip and not be effective anymore. So they need to be maintained. Um, and you just regularly inspect them. Like as I mentioned, um, if they've been damaged, repair or replace them if they reach the end of their lifespan. And just because an inlet drains to sediment control pond doesn't mean you don't have to keep sediment out because you will fill up your sediment pond very quickly, likely will not clean out your sediment pond in a reasonable amount of time and your sediment control pond won't be effective. Um, so moving on to sediment control pond and traps. So 
Um, these promote settling of sediment by detaining runoff at the end of a treatment drain. Um, when you're looking at sediment traps, we encourage these for areas that are smaller than two hectares and they can just be constructed across a depression um, by um, like or across or in, like a ditch. Uh, and you just create a depression and it can be in an existing swale or ditch. Um, and there's smaller areas. That's the picture, kind of a small example of that would be the picture on the far right. Um, whereas sediment control ponds are for any areas larger than two hectares. They have a permanent pool of water in them. So they they are, they do differ in that way. Um, and that provides enhanced sediment settling because that water that exists in there, it's a wet pond. It kind of dissipates the flow and causes the settling as soon as water enters. Um, and then the pond outlets, if they do have like a full outlet um, structure, uh, they can, they're controlled at a rate over an extended period of time. They mitigate stream erosion. Um, and there, there's all kinds of sizing criteria you have to consider too. Um, I think here is some of the sizing criteria to consider. So this is directly from the ESC guide, all the sizing criteria and all the different components of sediment control ponds that should be designed. And there's also a drawing for a sediment trap in an earthen ditch that we've included for the first time. This is a brand new drawing. Um, so I encourage definitely anyone designing these features to check them out or reviewing designs of these features to check out the guidance we provided there because it's pretty comprehensive. Um, I think the last category here that we're going to look at in terms of sediment controls is um, just weir tanks and active treatment systems. So um, what we're um, looking at here is just like um, anything that is, the, I mean, so, so the bottom picture here on the, the right is a pretty fancy system. So the one on the top is just the weir tank and the one on the bottom is a system that contains pretty much all the bells and whistles, almost like a mobile, uh, if you will, like mobile um, like water treatment facility that you could install on your site and and maybe in, in required in some circumstances, but it really depends on your site and what your red legislative discharge requirements are that may be in place and, and the kind of water you're dealing with and contaminants that might be there that are not on every site. So um, weir tanks are known as fractionation weir tanks and all it is is that they just provide a uh, space for water detention uh, it's similar to a pond, really. It just provides uh, settling. Um, they can be convenient in small footprint. So um, they they can be used for shorter term treatment needs if you don't want to like or don't have to install a pond and you want to just have something you can just bring in on a shorter term situation. Um, weir tanks can be used as a part of an active treatment system, which is the one again on the bottom corner there. And those provide like a higher level of water quality treatment. They can include um, a tank employing weirs, um, other hydrodynamic processes for physical separation of floatables. You can, uh, the, the treatment system will also include potentially uh, some sort of polymer, tech, um, flocculant, any sort of flocculant that's going to make, the flocculant just makes um, the sediment particles bind to one another so they're heavier and they settle out. And then uh, types of filters. So a lot of times you'll see a sand filter um, and one of the pieces of this system would be like a sand filter for polishing. So it's a very involved system, depending on the contaminants you want to remove. This is obviously something that's brought in by a company professionals that are engaged in this type of work. But this is an option. These exist for construction projects as well. Um, and I mentioned polymer flocculants, but just to kind of give a better understanding of what those are, you can see the little sample there where they've put some um, flocculin inside of a pretty turbid sample of water. But what it does is encourages the sediment particles to bind to one another and they form masses that then just are easier to either filter out with a filter or they actually are heavier so they just settle out um, and it just expedites sediment removal and especially if you have fine particles that are never going to settle out just with time and they're always remaining in suspension and you can never provide as much detention time as you need to get those settled out this is just a quicker way to get to where you need to be in terms of achieving your water quality goals um, and so there's many types that exist, but two of the most common ones are polyacrylamides and, and chitazan um, that are used in this type of system where it's like chitazan would be in a very controlled system where you're, there's metering. You can just make sure there's no chitazan when the water that's released um, at the end of the system. So it's very much controlled and metered. 
Um, but um, these are options available um, that exist on sites that have been used, but not very commonly, but they're used a lot more in, in the US for sure. Um, and again, polymer flocculants should, uh, should be anything that's used in this type of application on a construction site should be non-toxic to humans and other terrestrial and aquatic organisms uh, effective. So you need to know first that it's going to be effective for your site soils. So when you go um, and choose one, the company may work with you to get a, you a soil sample of your site and they will give you the exact formulation that's best for your soils. So you don't want to just rely on something that doesn't actually even bind your soils because there are different ones for different soil types. You want to make sure it's practical for use in the outdoors and otherwise safe to be used by people on site and everything as they're installing them and everything. Um, never to be used in natural water bodies. And uh, in general, cationic polymers have in past studies shown a higher toxicity to aquatic organisms. So we would generally say those should be avoided, but um, you know, it is a case by case basis. Uh, but in the absence of better understanding, we do have, you know, some information that they, they do attach to fish scales and cause hypoxia. So uh, that's something we've avoided in the past. And there are some um, resources in these guidelines here, all on the SEP website. So there's a a polymer background error and application guide, and of course the ESC guide we've talked about several times. Um, I think actually this is the last thing we wanted to talk about, just vehicle tracking controls. I want to point out that there are different options, but the vast majority of sites you're just going to see mud mats, rock stone pads underlined with geotextile fabric or prefabricated products in various designs that are considered mud mats, but then there are other things out there and the level of sophistication varies depending on what you need for your site and how much you're willing to spend. Uh, there are shaker racks and grates um, that are prefabricated products that just provide a stable entrance and actually just rumble the tires and shake some of, I think there was one called rumble track too, but it shakes the tires and shakes the soil out and then it has somewhere that catches all that sediment um, underneath the grate. And then there's wheel washers, which are pretty sophisticated and expensive, but there's also less, um, sophisticated wheel washers. This is a pretty, the Cadillac of wheel washers over here, but there's also like easier ones, hosing station and simpler ones where there's just water uh, kind of washing the tires in a more passive way. Uh, so there's all kinds of options out there, but it's very important to like not track sediment off your site and, and keep, uh, construct, consider vehicle tracking controls um, to not have sediment leaving your site, which like pollutes the roads, local roads, and increases resident complaints, but also that water eventually also is going to end up in a receiver too, because when it rains, all that street sediment is going to end up somewhere too. So um, important. And then I want to just point out if you want to see like a mud mat drawing, that's another drawing we did develop for the ESC guide this time around. And the mud mat design detail that can be used, you know, anyone designing these uh, sites is there now to be used. So that's something that's brand new and available for ESC designers um, to to kind of draw on as a resource. Um, that's it. I think I'm a bit over time. I would like to still take questions for anybody that you know has the time to come and is interested in asking any questions. And I really thank everybody for your attention today. Um, yeah. And if you have any questions, Sarah, if you heard any questions in the chat, or if anybody wants to just ask questions verbally, like I'm more than no. happy to take them. We do have one question in the chat. Uh, do you recommend using uh, phthalate-free hoses? Sorry, how did, what was that word again? Uh, phthalate-free hoses. Oh, phthalate-free. Yeah. So it's a P, okay, sorry, I know, I know what you're saying now. Um, and the hoses for um, like the pumps, I, I, yeah, so I, I, I would be lying if I said I, I had considered that I haven't. Okay. I haven't thought about no that worries. particular There is a comment um, mm -hmm. kind of answering that question and yeah. mentioning that if you are looking not to contaminate your water, that, that they should use phthalate-free hoses. Yeah. Um, all right. And we just have someone with their hand up. Jennifer, if you want to ask your question. Oh, you're just muted. If you just want to unmute yourself and ask your question. Sorry, I'm so used to Zoom where I can just hit the no space bar. Um, with regard to the fire logs and the sock installation, yes, um, there's discrepancies on how to install it because the people you buy them from tell you to put the stake through the middle. 
but we mm -hmm. all know that it's, they lift up over, they get destroyed much easier. They fall out. They did, mm -hmm. they just decompose. So I've been trying to encourage a different way to install them. I saw in some of the pictures where they're just in behind, you put the crossing over top to keep holding them down. Yeah. So how can we encourage everybody to work on better installation? Um, Cause the manufacturers have a like, you just put the stake through the middle. I'm like, yeah. that's not effective. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I've seen both too. And I've seen uh, debates like when we were developing the EC guide and they, they were putting the guidance together or like debating about what is the most effective, but that kind of um, what do you call that offset pattern where you put one on one side and then on the other side, you're kind of making up so that it doesn't shift at all. I've also seen somebody describe like if you can just stake it through a bit of the material in a way where it's not like right in the middle of it, but kind of like grabbing some of the material, but on the edge more um, or a combination of it. Um, I don't know how to encourage it best other than like encouraging people to read like the guidance. Um, I saw on the Kawartha Conservation website that they have really good instructional videos on installing ESCs. So if there could be, <laughs> I don't want to tell Kawartha CA to put out another video, but I think they're great videos and the more people that could see them, the better. Um, so it's just really good instructional videos go a long way, I think. Um, we haven't had the budget to do something like that in a while, but I think. Those are excellent. I mean, a video always gets further than anything written in like a very long document could ever, you know, permeate. Uh, but I do think you have a point and I've seen many of them ripped and destroyed over time. Um, and the other approach can be just as effective ensuring they don't shift, especially if they're kind of somehow stabilized, maybe on just the ends. So like they don't have that give to like move back and forth and you're just kind of putting like keeping them in place, but they don't have any leeway. If you're staking them only at the very tips or something, um, that might be a way around getting them to have like a huge, not to have a huge hole in them, like all the way through. But I agree. I've heard that complaint and there was a bit of a debate about it, but I do think it's better to avoid like having a huge stake right in the middle. Yeah. Um, and that kind of leads to my second question of, and I see that Joel has something similar where we're having issues trying to ensure that contractors are using their best management practices. How do I encourage contractors? Honestly, it's a fight to get them to install proper ESC measures into their catch basin. Yeah. It's a constant battle. They'll put the fabric in, at least that's something yeah. that they refuse to maintain no matter how often I report that it needs to be done. Yeah. And I don't know how, and again, it's going to the swim pond, but I'm trying yeah. to we want to minimize the amount of times they have to dig that thing out because that causes a lot of cost mm -hmm. and issues with animals and everything else that comes with that. So that that's where the complication comes in. How do we get contractors on board with all of this? Yeah. We're having a, and I'm not saying all of them. I've got some really great guys, but there are some that are just so <laughs> frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to ask, sorry. What, what was your name again? Sorry, I'm not in the Teams window, so it's hard for me to see oh, all the details Jennifer. about it. Jennifer. And Jennifer, are you with Kawartha or? No, I'm actually with uh, Natural Resource Solutions, at a uh, consulting firm based out of Okay. Work. Okay. So I would say, I mean, I, the obvious step to get them to do better um, inlet controls would be to in, require not a sediment like a, a geotextile fabric. It requires something better than that because if you use the sack, it the maintenance is much longer. Like you can get way more time of effectiveness. It's not even just that it gets full and clogged; it rips, like it's destroyed all the time. Um, so, I think if you can get them to just say like we require these other products to be used, and you're going to have to do less maintenance, and it's going to work for longer. That's the easy way, but like. As long as that exists as an option from regulatory perspective and it's not like encouraged to use something better, like I think it's really the municipality's purview to say, we're going to need you to put in these other better controls. Like this one's just not doing it for us. You're not maintaining it enough. You're never going to maintain it. It's just going to sit there. Um, I think that's the only way to really push it. And municipalities have all the tools really to um, enforce that too because they can take letters of credit for like in, they have all these financial mechanisms where they can kind of 
the first the approval process and the requirements to make them stick to what they've said in terms of erosion and sediment control. Okay. No, and that's and that's something that I always forget to do is go back to the regulatory agencies being like I'm having issues because yeah. I try to manage as much and I hate to bring those regulatory agencies in when it's something yeah, you know what, I, I understand where you're coming from, that it does need to, it's beyond my control at this point, And I do need to talk to you the next level. So, but yeah, I think there also just there's a comfort with being used to the same thing over and over again. And I order my materials from the same guy and the same guy that gives me that material is going to give me that material. And that's the material I'm going to put over there. And I've never bought this other thing. And I don't want to buy this other thing. I don't know where to get it from. So it's just like changing, breaking that I don't know exactly how. I've been thinking about this for many, many years. And this is no, so I think we're in the same boat on that. How can we <laughs> yeah. change the conversation? So, no, that's perfect. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, great. I think I saw another hand up, but maybe their question was answered. Oh, perfect. Go ahead. Lisa, I, I'm, I'm just uh, wondering in connection with the rural erosion control products. The turf reinforcement mats uh, consisting of the synthetic polypropylene fibers woven together. Mm -hmm. uh, any idea on the reality of the environmental impact on that on the long term? Yeah, I mean, I think that's something, unfortunately, like we have in the whole issue of like plastics and in the environment and everything that um, ha like we we haven't been thinking about that as much as we should have until recently, I think. And we think, okay, well, it's always a good idea to reinforce this slope. And, you know, we don't want to have to come back and fix this a million times. Um, but I think in reality, yeah, I mean, it is, um, there's a photodegradable, I would be lying if I said I understood the full chemistry of like the photodegradable netting, degradable netting, but I would hope as we get into more, these alternative plastics, like corn sugar based products like you see for other plastic substitutes in the world that we'll start to see like these products there too where it's like plant-based or like corn or something uh, type of plastic that can be substituting that but i don't know that the industry is there or at least not that i've seen so far okay or substituted yeah Okay, I, I, that's something that has troubled me for some time. The yeah. other issue was the polymer uh, flocculants, the cationic polymers that yeah. um, obviously have ongoing environmental negatives attached to them. And mm -hmm. even, even uh, I, I wonder, once this sediment has been uh, removed from the soil and mm -hmm. we see that these flocu flocculants that have been used where do they go? What do they do yeah. with them? Because they still have these polymers attached to them in landfill or wherever they're used. Yeah. So with polyacrylamides, I know a little bit more just about that particular topic. Um, so they don't, I mean, acrylamide is something associated with cancer. Um, yeah. But polyacrylamides, the prefer preferred pathway of it breaking down is not to acrylamides. Like that is not like how it typically breaks down in mm -hmm. the environment so i know there has been some study in that and there is some concern it's more that you want to make sure the polyacrylamide you get has a low percentage of acrylamide in it um it's hard to explain but like when there's when they're ma manufactured if you get one that has just a very low percentage of acrylamide left that's what you want because itself is not going to break down in the environment um, sunlight and everything's not going to catalyze it to break down into, into acrylamide, which is a carcinogen. Um, it has other pathways it breaks down. Now, the fate of all the different things and ho the health effects of all the different things in it, we don't necessarily have all the answers. Kytosan is a naturally occurring thing. So uh, cationic polymers, just like the other polymer, uh, that's bad for fish, but otherwise they're chemically the same. Like cationic polyacrylamide, anionic polyacrylamide, they're made of uh, acrylamide inside them. But they're bad for fish, but not necessarily other health effects. Um, and then other polymers like chitosan are naturally occurring and even occur in food supplements, like they're from crab shells. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot to think about. And I definitely think, even though they're used a lot in the, in the US, there's not a lot of information. Now, 
polymer manufacturers will tell you they've done a lot of research and have the answers for many, many things these days. There's a company out of Alberta called Clearflow. Um, and they recently met with me and said that they've got more updated research than what I've covered up till now in my research. So they're always looking to prove that their product's safe and they do as much research as needed. So, I mean, it's the kind of thing where you really have to look into it if you're going to choose to put something on your site and all right. about all that. Okay. I yeah. appreciate that. Thank you very no much. No problem. Okay. So I'm going to read out some of the chat questions as well. Uh, do you have any recommendations for in-stream sediment controls on bank revetment or stabilization projects? Mm. I mean, I'm not a huge expert on the in-stream controls. We had an entire course on in-stream uh, works. Um, it wasn't delivered by me. It was delivered by somebody else. Um, and it's not part of this. But uh, I can try to get, I would say, Maybe check out the EC guide because there's an entire section on in water works. Um, but also, um, I can try to dig up some of that content and pass that along uh, and get maybe in touch with like some of the people that are better versed. Like within TRCA, for sure, we have a lot of people that have more knowledge than that than I do in that. And I can get this, you in touch with the right people that give you the right advice because it's a whole nother ballgame. Hey, great. So are there common ESD practices employed by contractors in the field that don't match well with the research on effectiveness as BMP? So I think that kind of goes back to uh, Jennifer's question as well. Mm -hmm. So are there, there. are there common practices that they use that don't match effectiveness with the match with what the research says? Yeah, I think in general, like, um, yeah, people do the same thing over and over again. Um, I think generally the lack of main, the research shows that maintaining and, and certain things, um, work like, for example, stabilizing a seeded area, uh, you'll see somebody spend a lot of money on seed and then they didn't do something properly and all of it washes down or there's all kinds of rills and it's, it's ruined. Um, so I think just like, I, I think just like the maintenance part of it, the keeping on top of things, I don't. Aside from like the very basic things like a sediment fence of a pond that's not stabilized. So that's something a lot of times you'll see ponds will not be stabilized. Um, that doesn't match with the guidance. Uh, that causes real erosion right into the pond. The pond becomes itself a source of sediment. Um, how often the ponds should be maintained is not. So I think many, many things in the guidance and research has shown to be important are not things that get applied on site. And yeah, there's a, there's a gap there for sure. Hey, and you're comfortable if anyone has any other questions that they can contact you. Wonderful. So I think that brings us to the end of today's questions and I'll be sending out the, the PowerPoint presentation to everyone as well. So thank you for joining us today. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lisa, for sharing your expertise. And for a complete listing of all available training, please visit the events and training tab at sustainabletechnologies.ca. Uh, thank you again and have a great day.